Hello and welcome to Media MD, your fortnightly Doof Network dose of media that you have somehow missed. I'm Ruben Morehouse. I'm Elliot Diebold. And we are joined again by our special guest to talk about Star Wars The Clone Wars. Hi guys, thanks for having me again. Welcome back, welcome back. Um, Thank you. Now, Georgia, we would normally do a plot summary, but this is an anthology, and so I don't know if it's worth doing. I guess the plot is just, there's a war going, there's one of them Star Wars going on, and uh, yeah. <laughs> each episode of The Clone it, yeah. Wars <laughs> basically just focuses on a different bit of the Star War. Yeah, it's it's like yeah. it's interesting though, it's not like, I'd call it like soft anthology, because there's yes. through lines. And there's lots of recurring characters, but it's definitely, it, it, it's, I, I don't know if I've quite seen something like this where it's definitely built to be like a Saturday morning cartoon where you don't really have mm. to worry about watching it in order. Um, that said, there, I think Georgia mentioned in the prescription, there are like these groups of like, you know, three or four episodes that will form a bit of an arc, which, you know, yeah. clearly you, you kind of need to watch those in order to fully understand them, but. There's so many places where you could just jump in and, and pick up the show without needing context. Yeah, yeah, definitely. absolutely. Um, I guess the loose plot threads are we have uh, Anakin Skywalker, who is a Jedi Knight, and his uh, Padawan, yep. his apprentice. So I'm just going to stop you there, Ruben. Like, has anyone not seen the Star Wars prequels? Like, it's between... <laughs> I haven't seen the Star Wars prequels, Elliot. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, okay, that's weird. I, I've I've seen the original trilogy and I've seen two of the recent trilogy and I've seen the holiday special. I haven't seen any other Star Wars thing. <laughs> the holiday special? That's an interesting choice. Yeah, it's because Elliot made choice. me watch it for <laughs> oh, Medium okay. D one no, that time. That explains it then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I had never seen any of the prequels, so I kind of oh, had yeah. an interesting vibe of this where I didn't know anything about the Clone Wars. I think the only thing I knew going in was that. Anakin turns into Darth Vader over the course of the prequel, spoiler, I guess. And also, and this is something that I'm surprised no one else figured out in the show, um, Palpatine is clearly evil and turns into yeah. the Emperor, right? Like, he's <laughs> yeah. clearly evil. And nobody seems evil. to get it. He, Yeah, he's so clearly evil. I mean, it didn't come up in the show because I guess this was before, or like yeah. chronologically before he turns into uh, the baddie darth something sidious maybe is that right yeah that is right yeah. oh sweet okay good um but yeah he's so clearly designed to look evil oh yeah he's got like the dark shadows around his eyes like the creepy smile yeah i think the show to its credit it does manage to hold back just enough so that he doesn't ever really act evil that we see mm. Yeah, we've never seen... I think there was one scene in the first season. I, so I've watched the entire first season. I didn't watch any of the further stuff yet. Uh, but there's only, I think, one moment in the first season where a character that I think is Darth Sidious is talking to Count Dooku, but we don't see him enough to be like, oh, it's Palpatine. Mm. Like, it's clearly they're, ch they're acting as though the audience doesn't know that that's Palpatine. Yeah, exactly. They are sort yeah. of pretending that you're watching this between episodes two and three. Um, yeah. which is like when it's set. I, I but yeah, I agree. Like, there's definitely like I was expecting him to be acting like a maniacal villain sometimes because of the character design. Because as you said, like you see the character design, yes. and you're like, well, that's an evil person. Um, yeah, he's clearly a baddie. <laughs> but they they managed to hold off of actually doing that, and that was one of the things I quite liked. Is I, I think yeah. it would have they really would have overdone it if 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 they'd yeah. been doing it, it would have been like oh, no, we can't let that happen to the Trade Federation. And they're like, everyone looks away and he fucking does like the Monty Burns, like, you know, finger <laughs> thing. <laughs> yeah, totally. There, there are a few episodes where plot points revolve around, like, uh, there's there's moles or someone's got information that they shouldn't have. And it just seems like, like, I know in my heart, oh, Palpatine's probably just fed some information to the other side here. Mm. But I actually really liked that it never became something vital enough to focus on, that it was just kind of a background bit. That that would be a really hard line to walk because if you were trying mm. to like make it so that it was Palpatine who did it and they were looking for the person, it, it's a plot thread they wouldn't be able to do because that happens in the third movie yes. that they discover it. Yeah. So like it'd have to be something that just went nowhere. So they they just seemed to avoid yeah, it, which was definitely the right call. <laughs> yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, I agree. I think they knew that that had already been, that's a big part of the film. So they just kind of decided to focus on everything around that um, instead, which is, yeah, definitely the right move. Yeah. Um, just uh, as well, because I wanted to bring up um, it, like the, the anthology, or soft anthology nature of it. Mm. Uh, it's it's in- it's so interesting because as i said i haven't seen anything like it and it's both a strength and a curse in so many yeah, ways because it's like i i really struggle to get invested in a lot of the characters a- a- and stuff or-, or even the plots of individual episodes knowing that they just sort of get tossed away in next episode yeah but then at the same time that made it so much easier like i i was just able to put this on you know, when I needed something to watch, when I wanted something on in the background while I was cooking dinner, like I was just watching this in so many different circumstances and I found it very bingeable because it's just, it was so digestible because there's no pressure of actually really needing to follow it too closely. Yeah, yeah no, I, I definitely agree. I think with the, in terms of characters and getting attached, it is hard. I feel like it's not until quite a few seasons in that you start to, when the characters have recurred enough times that you start to actually care about them. But then at the same time, you get to see this really wide range of different characters yeah. who, like, and, and you care more about the side characters than you would normally because you don't have kind of super set protagonists. So I did kind of like that aspect yeah. of it. But, yeah, I agree. It's, it's, sort of, it's good and bad. It's yeah. just kind of different, It's I guess. a really good point that one of, the, one of the other strengths is they get to explore a lot of other characters. Like, the first episode is a really bad example, but for some reason it's jumping in my mind, like how it's the Yoda episode. And... <laughs> I didn't think that was a very good episode. No, that, that's no. what I'm saying. It's a terrible episode, but it's a great example of how they can just focus in on, on a new character. For Well, for let me reason. give you a, another example, because I found the more standalone an episode was, the more I enjoyed it, especially yeah. the episodes that revolved around, that really focused in on a group of clone soldiers. Yes. Um, mm. The clone soldiers were by far my favourite characters in this. I found they were always so interesting as characters. And there was one episode especially which was called The Hidden Enemy, which is one where they find out that one of the clone troopers is like a mole working for Ventress, who is a Padawan to Count Dooku. Um, And the whole episode is basically... I mean, there's a a B-plot of... uh, I think it's Obi-Wan and Anakin going to fight Ventress. But the, the main plot of the episode is these two clone troopers trying to figure out who is the mole within their organization. And it was so compelling to me. Like anytime clone troopers took front stage, I, I just loved the episode. There was one in, uh, in Ryloth towards the end of the season where they kind of walk around with a little girl. That's like really, really engaging. Um, there's an earlier one where they have to kind of defend a, like a, a guard outpost because there's a, a fleet coming in and they need to kind of warn uh, the Senate that, that an attack is being made by the separatists and all these clone trooper focused episodes. I just was like enthralled by, I absolutely loved them. I, I completely agree. Although it, like the, the trooper focused ones are a bit of a monkey's paw because they're, they're so good. But at the same time, I'm like, Oh, it sucks that this is a kid's show and they can't go really like, I could just yeah. watch a show that properly explores the concept of like, clone identity and yeah and all that yeah. um i guess very mild spoilers i chew- i chewed through this um and the the opener to season three actually has the ones from that outpost oh, episode wow, you got in really the far um yeah i did um but it, yeah so that that outpost <laughs> one where they were defending mm. that outpost from the fleet those clones yep. come back for another one and i was amazed at how much i was like oh my god it's these it's these clones that's fives and 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 you know blah blah yeah oh just you wait elliot <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it it's probably not surprising but as the series goes on they do focus more and more on the clones probably um and like you get to know certain clones and i really like that in the you know in the films the clones are just clones and yeah. they're all one and the same and you don't really care about them at all and then in this show they manage to you know, that's the one thing I do like about the pilot is that they establish really early on that, mm. you know, the clones actually are separate people. Mm. Yeah. Um, and they start characterizing them pretty quickly. And even though it's different sets of clones pretty much every episode, you start to realize that they will have names, have got different personalities. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, there, there are definitely recurring runs, like Rex obviously being the main yeah. one. Rex was my favorite character in the entire show so far. I absolutely love Rex. Yeah. And like, He's great. Yeah, and there's um, particularly the end of season 
five, I think it is. So like the first finale that they did mm. um, is very like clone centric. It's all kind of like pre order sixty six stuff and really focuses in on like Rex and Fives and Jesse and all those guys. Right. Um, yeah. And, and the finale as well, like the main finale as well, is very much just like Rex and Ahsoka. So, yeah, at, at the clones definitely make their way front and centre as the series goes on as well, which I think was a really good idea because, yeah. yeah, I agree. that they're, they're so interesting because it's like it's just a, a crazy idea, you know. They've just been bred for this one purpose. Mm, but they're like humans. And like what, like what the hell do you do with that? Yeah. yeah. But yeah, the, so the yeah the one of the one one of the later ones I saw was the one set on Camino where it actually starts to dive into them training, and that was the first one that started to touch more deeply on these ideas of like what what is the mentality of being a clone that was bred to be yeah. a pawn in a war? Um, yeah, it's yeah, especially after the war. Like, what do you do when the war is over? Like, they're tr- trying to achieve one thing, which is to finish the war. But then what does that mean for them? Because they have no purpose after yeah. that. I can see why a lot of them would end up on board with Order 66 to be part of the Empire. So this is something that I didn't know about beforehand since I hadn't watched the prequels. But I, I should guess I should reveal that this show got me to do something I never thought I would do, which is care about Star Wars lore. So I was Googling <laughs> like Order 66 and Palpatine and stuff to try and understand the things that I'd missed. So correct me if I'm wrong, Order 66 was this order that Palpatine snuck in a bunch of, amongst a group of like emergency kind of inset, uh, you know, reactions where if the Jedi go rogue, the clone troopers are authorized to kill them, but it doesn't have as many protections as other orders. And Palpatine kind of used it to turn the clone troopers on the Jedi and wipe them all out. Is that right? It's something like that. I don't remember all those mm, yeah. details, but like definitely the bear is. Yeah, he he tells a bunch of clones Order sixty six, and that's when they like kill off all the Jedi, and only a handful survive. Mm. Yeah, and Clone Wars sort of reveals why it is that that is so easy yeah. to do because you've probably noticed the clones are like extremely loyal. Yes, I um, was assuming that was something the show would have to address at some point because of where I'm up to, I cannot see most of these clones just. Yeah, I can't see Jedi. Rex turning on Ahsoka or something, right? Like. Mm. Yeah, which yeah. um yeah, that kind of comes up in sort of seasons five, six, seven. I'm I'm yeah. excited to see where Ahsoka goes because I I've got to admit I was a little disappointed with what I've watched because she hasn't really had much of a character arc and it's kinda of like she's the only main character who who can. Like Anakin and Obi Wan are kind of in a holding pattern because they have to be mm. as they were at the start of episode three. So they can't really do yeah. they can't too change much too with much. Them. Yeah. yeah, and so I was kind of really expecting Ahsoka to be the character that the show was like, "Hey, here's a character we can do stuff with." And I'm I'm like two and a bit seasons in, and they haven't done shit with her yet. And I was just like, "Oh, like I hope I hope this changes as the show goes on." Um, because it sounds like you know I, I've been on the wiki wiki page for it, and you know it's been cancelled and, and on hiatus a bunch of times. So I assume it's very different in those later seasons. Um, so hopefully that changes. Yeah, because it's funny, like, I mean, I watched it a few years ago and then rewatched it recently and I had kind of that same thought. I was in the first three seasons and I was like, I, you know, Ahsoka's probably my favourite character in this and she's, like, hardly even been in it sort of, mm. you know, compared to what I remember. Like, I remember her being, like, she's so pivotal, I guess, later on, but probably now that I think about it doesn't really start getting more focused on until probably season four. Um it's yeah. definitely the Anakin mm. and Obi Wan show mostly. I'd say at the start, um, yeah, I found Anakin so interesting. It was kind of like because he's it, like he was such a shit Jedi in the way that the Jedi Order has all these tenets of like you must not form attachments, like blah blah blah. Oh and, God, can and, we? T- uh, no, yeah, wait, wait, we'll get to that in a second. Let, I guess. let me finish. <laughs> let me finish a positive thing before we talk about the Jedi. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. Like, the Jedi Order has all these structure and and, and blah blah blah. Yeah. Very good rules that make a lot of sense. And, and he's a very, like, emotional and, and has no temperament for a Jedi. And, and it works out for him in all these ways. And, like, just thinking, like, this knowledge that he becomes Vader in my head was kind of disappointing because I was like, I would love to see Anakin turn against the Jedi Order, but not in the way I saw it done in, in the movies. Like, I'd love to just yeah. see Clone Wars Anakin go evil and be against, like, Obi-Wan and all of them. Like, that is so much more interesting to me than seeing you know 30 years down the line darth vader who's just been well, so corrupted he's he's completely right. different 
Because the thing is, he wouldn't go evil. He just would have a good point that the Jedi are not a good system and he wants to put a better system in place. And yes, that means he has to be against potentially, you know, Obi-Wan or Ahsoka, but like, Mm. not join the Separatists because the Separatists are also pieces of shit, but just be better than the Jedi because the Jedi are terrible. (laughs) It's like, this is just such a good point and there's just, I can't really go into what I want to say without any massive spoilers. But Fair yeah, enough. that's it's that's so true. <laughs> Can we talk about how terrible the Jedi are? Um, yes, I mean, yeah. they're <laughs> genuinely the worst, and I hate them all so much. Like, uh, I guess Obi Wan is the one who gets the main focus of this, but I mean, there, there's a reason there's like three Sith and hundreds of Jedi, and they still manage to lose. And it's, yeah, it's because oh my God. yeah, yeah. Well, it's actually one of the things I really like about the show because um i think you know you had the original trilogy and the jedi were like these past mysterious people who were just apparently really really awesome and i guess pretty idolized uh and then you know in the prequels you go back and the whole point is that the jedi have actually uh, by that end point of the war have actually become pretty corrupt like they're very bureaucratic they're really political um yeah. they're completely Un, like detached from the common person um like yeah. they're all sort of nice people but they just like don't really in, instead of you know their whole role is supposed to be protecting just the lay people from like criminals like hondo yeah um but yeah. instead they're like buddies with hondo because they're just like oh well you know we're, we've got to go pick on dooku instead so we don't really care about your piracy it's like well yeah isn't that your job aren't you the police <laughs> Like, but they just <laughs> aren't you meant to care about these it. things? And, yeah. and they kind of they, again they go into it more in the later seasons. But just um, the fact that the Jedi actually by this point where you're watching Clone Wars, they're not really doing their job at all. Um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting to watch because you still sort of as individuals you don't hate them. Like you sort of they're all nice and you like yeah. them. They've still got all these admirable qualities. Yeah, um, but at the same time you're just sitting there like, what are you doing? Yeah, my read was kind of that they're just so weighed down by bureaucracy, and maybe it's an unfair read because they do have Palpatine in charge of them, who is clearly not, like, in the interest of doing good for the the Jedi. (laughs) But, like, there's an example, one of the early episodes, which had a number of problems uh, because it centred around... Jar Jar and 3PO and uh, Padme, I liked. Oh, God, what about the... I, I actually didn't hate Padme as much as I was expecting to. The holy trinity of bad, that episode. Like, yeah. Jar Jar, C-3PO, <laughs> right, and Padme. Right. I was just like, why would you do this to the audience? That's just unfair. Um, yeah, so this is this uh, this is an episode where uh, they go to a, a, a planet where uh, Pat, Pat, one of Padme's friends, like her dad's friends when she was growing up, has requested her help, and he kidnaps her and tries to sell her or, like, give her to the Separatists in exchange for, like, food for his people, Right. And the whole point is he has been unable to get any kind of assistance from the Jedi for a long time. And so he's kind of desperate to help his people. And eventually the episode resolves with he does the right thing. And then the Jedi are just like, all right, now we'll give you food. And I'm just kind of like, what the (laughs) fuck is your problem, Jedi? Like, you teach people how to treat you in that the only way to actually get your attention is to kidnap a senator and then ransom them and then do the right thing and then hope that they'll just be like, all right, now we'll allow you to have some rations. Like, they're just clearly so shit at their job that I can't feel bad for them that, I think the other that episode, people hate them. Uh, sh- yeah, sure. It's sort of a similar thing was the um, uh, the one where they go to that, there's like that small moon um, where there's mm. the native people and there's that yes. little asshole guy. Yes. And basically the whole episode is like you can't just go and kill these people because you want to. Um, yeah. And then he's just shielded by all this bureaucracy. Mm. And, like, there's yeah. these two Jedi, like really powerful Jedi just standing there and they're like, oh, I want to stop him, but uh, I just can't. But I can't because, do anything. It's, oh, well. It's against the Senate. The <laughs> oh, Senate shucks. Yeah. yeah. And it's like they're just going to let him kill all these people just because of bureaucracy. And you're like, that is clearly not your job. It's it's actually the worst. I think this is the episode where I wrote down a note of just, is the Jedi Order intentionally negligent or just stupid? <laughs> yeah. was, was a theme that came up in my notes a lot. Um, I really, really hated the Jedi. <laughs> I, I, yeah, one question I had I, was, 
Am I supposed to be on the separatist side this often? Because mm. they obviously have their monstru- monstrous qualities, but there are so many episodes where the Republic felt more like an empire than a republic and I, i'm not trying to mm. do it em- because obviously empire is a loaded word in the star wars world but you know like they, they put all these restrictions on planets and punish them for not being members of the republic in a way that just feels kind of tyrannical to me and so yeah. like i could see the appeal of the separatists even though you know again like whenever we actually see separatists they're you know monsters and cowards they're villains yes <laughs> But that's because I feel like the show has to make it clear that they're the bad guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they actually do have an episode that directly addresses that later on where um, uh, this isn't too big a spoiler, but basically um, one of Padme's very old friends, as it turns out, is uh, a senator in the Separatist Alliance and asks for her help with something or other. And they go Mm. there and she's just this, like, really nice lady um, and – Basically, Padme takes Ahsoka along to show her that it's not all black and white and that the Separatists Mm. actually have pretty valid concerns. Turns out their main concern is that the Republic is so bogged down by bureaucracy that they can't ever do anything, and that's why they separated. And you sit there and, and yeah, you get to the end of the episode, you're like, well, I'm a Separatist. Like, (laughs) (laughs) these guys are idiots. And the only problem with the Separatist Alliance is that they happen to be being led by a Sith Lord um, and yeah. pretty much apart yeah. from that, they're kind of right. Oh, yeah. I, like, if absolutely. they didn't have like Dooku and Grievous and stuff, I think they would be, I would 100% be on board with the Separatists. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, I, I can't remember if it's in season one, but there's the there's the uh, episode where they introduce the Alliance of Neutral Worlds, um, who are worlds that just want to stay out of the war. And the Republic is very aggressively like anti that policy. And Well, that I, basically I, is just separatist thought right like don't yeah, want to be a part of the exactly republic. but that was that was one of the ones where i was like they're, they're so like the republic felt very controlling they need to they felt like they needed to conquer everything like a world needs to be a part of the republic or like you know they basically hold it at ransom um yeah, yeah. they're kind and of the shitty big, the big problem that comes up related to that is that you know like these neutral worlds so i think in the one you're probably talking about is where mandalore basically yes. asks for the help of the Jedi who are supposed to protect everyone in the galaxy, but because they've become tangled up in all the politics of the Republic, they refuse to help because, or, or they're much more limited in the help that they'll give because they don't want to yeah. like annoy the Republic, but they're supposed to be peacekeepers for the whole galaxy. So why won't they go and help these people mm. who need help just because they're not a part of some political group? And you sit there and you're like, this is, what the hell? Like, why are the Jedi this way? Um, so to, to to move on to a different point, like, because uh, I want to focus more <laughs> on the positives because there is a lot to like here. Um, but I don't know if that's a negative because I'm actually surprised by how much it made the politics of the Star Wars universe, which is something that I'd always heard was terribly shit. I, yeah. It made it more engaging to me. Like, I was actually more engaged in the political conflicts now because I didn't really believe in either side and so it was kind of like <laughs> yeah that's fair. seeing both sides in a lot of ways yeah and i think i touched on that in the prescription that like that's i think yeah one of the big things that the, the prequels got really criticized for having all these boring politics but after you've watched the clone wars it you're actually pretty interested in the politics like <laughs> they do a pretty good job of making it really interesting yeah i feel like i'd have a better basis for understanding it because you know it's been probably a decade since i watched the prequels um, but I remember just not really understanding what was happening in the politics parts, and that was why I didn't like them so much. Now I probably yeah, have a better understanding. Just like, oh, this is the Trade Federation and then these funny-looking aliens. You're like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and now you're watching yeah. you're like, oh, well, now I actually know who the Trade Federation are. That kind of means something to me now. Yeah, yeah, it made it feel real, right? Like it felt like an actual world instead of just here's one alien from Naboo and therefore, yeah. you know, you should listen to them or some random thing that would happen in Star Wars. Yeah, because yeah, I think Star Wars has always had a lot more to explore and that's probably why there is so much expanded universe or whatever it's called now content um, to, to dive into because, like, I think the movies just barely scratch the surface because they're too obsessed with the Skywalkers and Palpatines. Yep. Um, yep. I, I just, I also want to touch on, this is probably my last beat to do with characters, um the droids themselves i was i was cringing <laughs> so hard for the first four episodes e- every droid line i was just like oh this is such bad humor 
And then for whatever reason, from about episode five, five they just turned it around, and they're fucking hilarious after that. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, droid, just, the droid comedy is so good. Like I just, I was, I was literally laughing out loud almost every time they're on screen after that. I think it's just that they're so not afraid of death. So they'll, like, be in a fight and Grievous will be standing there and be like, oh, do this thing. And a droid will just make a wisecrack and Grievous will murder them because, yeah. like, of course he would. And they, they just will still keep doing it. Like, there's just so many of them. They can just do stupid shit and get murdered as a result and nobody really cares. But they also, like, there is, there are jokes built around them not wanting to die. Like, sometimes, but, uh, yeah, uh, again, I, I've watched it also close together i don't know if i'm quoting season two ones but there's a bit where like three jedi come in and there's like five droids and grievous is running away and he's like finish them and and the droids are like but they're jedi yeah and grievous is like i don't care <laughs> and and then they're just sort of like oh i hate this job <laughs> yeah like, yeah so again good. i can't remember if like this one's from clone wars or rebels or what but yeah there's one where it's like uh, have you ever actually killed a Jedi? Like, yeah, no. that happens in yeah, season one of Clone Wars. Both die. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they always just react so sadly whenever they see a Jedi. Like, they'll yeah. see a Jedi and yeah. just be like, aww, and then they'll die. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, They're great. I, I would actually, I was just hoping the whole time, like, as much as I love the Clone episodes, I, I, I agree with you, Ruben, they're probably my favourites. I was yeah. really holding out hope for just, like, a comedy droid episode. Like, I just I wanted to I think it wouldn't work. I, droid I don't know if it would work. Yeah. No, I like the idea, <laughs> but they're just so mindless. <laughs> like, there's such punchlines. I don't know. I, um, I, reckon... I do like that they always say Roger Roger. It's very fun. <laughs> I'm a progr- I'm I'm an individual. Roger, Roger, um, R- Roger, Roger, yeah. Roger, Roger. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, I, I, again, that would be like another interesting thing to explore in a more mature version of the show, like the, because obviously you have the clones, and we've talked about all the the psychology mm. to explore there. Um, similarly, like have the way they're opposed by machines that are also just sort of mass produced. I think could be something. Yeah. Really interesting. Like why why do the separatists never actually have to fight? They can rely on droid armies. That's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. I yeah. would like to see a, a a bottle episode where one clone and one droid are like forced to work together. <laughs> yes. That'd be a cool idea for an episode. Oh, that happens in Rebels. You'll have to make it. Oh shit! To, to Rebels. <laughs> all right, got yep. some catching up to do. Rebels is on the list. Um, should we talk about like this? This show does a really interesting thing in that it sets itself up. It it feels like it's a World War One or or World War Two like sort of movie. Like mm-hmm. I, I think it does a lot to borrow the aesthetic of coverage relating to to probably more World War One. Um, like it starts with this like you know sort of old radio broadcaster. It reminds me of Legend of Korra <laughs> yeah. did the same thing. It was very Legend yeah, of Korra. Yeah. I had the exact same thought. Um, but like the you know like it, it's sort of the stuff like y- you have these generals a- 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 with the Jedi, and first of all, like this is a great use of. One of the things about like Jedi and and the Force in Star Wars is you kind of have an excuse to have this small group of unqualified people be superpowered generals who are main characters mm. because they they are this literally superpowered, and, and then you have all the grunts. But like you know, for for a universe that has like droids and lasers and like faster than light travel, nobody's invented cover yet. Um, they like, are yeah. so bad at fighting. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and I think I think it's to lean into some of this like I, I, this World War One type yeah stuff like you know the you know it's it's the kind of maybe it's not even maybe it's like older than that but you know they're not even doing trench warfare like they all have to sort of stand up and and form in a line and it's just fucking dumb uh, but it sort mm. of suits that whole vibe of like a, a bit of an old timey war um, yeah I think they couldn't go into military tactics too much as well because this is like a show that's meant to skew a little younger. And so it's like, you know, I, there were so many times I would see usually Yoda actually do some movement where I was like, no, no, you could just like use your t- telekinesis and resolve this situation immediately. But instead he just kind of stands there deflecting bullets for like 10 <laughs> seconds before he does it. Yeah, anything. they do a lot of that, don't they? <laughs> and I, I, I kind of, I got annoyed at it at the start, but then I was kind of like, no, I, like I shouldn't worry too much about, the Jedi not min maxing their powers enough because this isn't like this isn't meant to be that kind of show, right? 
Well, I like this idea. Mm. Like, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep harping on about this, like World War One type metaphor. But one of the things that happened mm. there, if you look particularly at like some of the, like somewhere like Britain, um, you had like a lot of people in who were in the sort of upper class. They got just sort of made generals and sent off and were put in charge of a lot mm. of people. And I, I see that in the Jedi, in that they were trained peacekeepers who have now been made generals in this war, and they're not super trained for that. And it's something the show yeah. touches on. But it's like, you know, they're they're these privileged force users and they've just become generals. Um and yeah. and they're in charge of like, you know, thousands of clones in their lives. Yeah. yeah. And there's that I think it's one of the sort of last episodes and um basically yeah, the start of it focuses on Ahsoka, who I'm pretty yeah. sure at the time is like fourteen. And she's leading a mission, like you said, just because she's a Jedi, even though she's like a child. And she sort of gets a bit, you know, too into the moment and gets a bunch of clones killed and gets back and is like, oh, my God, what have I done? Yeah. And, yeah, it's, it's just like, like this poor 14-year-old girl <laughs> um, who's for some reason in charge of all these soldiers. And, yeah. yeah, and some of the Jedi treat the clones as quite expendable and then mm. others like Plo Koon, you know, sort of don't. Um, yeah, sort of an interesting dynamic. There have definitely been scenes where Anakin has run to defend Rex because it's Rex. It's like, no, that's a clone that I know the name of and I like him. Whereas others, it's kind of like, oh, you know, just stay here and need die. To be made. <laughs> yeah. Which kind of makes sense because, I mean, it's the same yeah. with, with every other person, right? Like, you'd maybe yeah. run out and risk your life to save somebody that you know, but when it's just like some rando, you possibly wouldn't. But that's why um, the clones are such a good metaphor for all this because, uh, you know, mm. like the. They're just clones, right? And it's like they're kind of as faceless as you can get fighters. Like it's it's something that's so rich to be explored, and and the show does a bit of it. But like you know, I just wish I could see the the like M rated version that does it even more. Oh, totally. Because I think it, it actually does not a bad job of like fifty percent of the time the war seems pretty glorified, and you're kind of like, oh, cool. And then they're just suddenly like out of nowhere. There'll be this moment where you just think where it's like really sad and and you suddenly mm. realize that all these people have just died or mm. um and you think oh no actually it was pretty bad like they do a really <laughs> like a funny mix of the two mm. yeah yeah um should we talk about the animations yeah. and the animation style and all that jazz yeah i thought it, i i i we can t- t- cover some of the technical stuff as well I, I there wasn't i thought it was all pretty good there was nothing where i was like super wowed by it but there was nothing where I yeah. found it lackluster either. I um, I, so to, to add a bit of context, I actually watched the movie. I know Georgia said not to, and she was right. It was trash. <laughs> yeah. um, but... I'm not taking any responsibility for that. <laughs> no, that no, that was all on me. Um, but like the animation in it is like shocking compared to even the pilot episode. To the mm. point where I'm pretty convinced that. This was like a studio, and I haven't actually looked this up, but I wouldn't be surprised to learn it was like they formed like this Star Wars. And a like CGI studio that was going to make these TV show movies, and the Clone Wars film would have been their first product. And then from there, they're like, okay, we can wait, do a TV show out of this because we've already got all the models and a bunch of animations and stuff. Um, because the the animation quality was so much better, and it got better where I got up to by the end of like you know season two. And I can see, mm-hmm. you know, if season seven came out now in twenty twenty, that's like twelve years later just based on what I know about, like, 3D animation and, and software and stuff, even with, like, a tenth of the budget, you could make something ten times better now than you could in 2008. Um, mm. So, like, I imagine it's, yeah, like, a hundred times better in, in Season 7. But definitely in these first two seasons, you can feel, like, you, you notice things like there was clearly a bit of a premium on new models. Like, there's so much recycling of, of like, background characters or unnamed characters just because... They want to reuse old models. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. The Jedi don't... There was one part in the end of season one where Mace Windu was doing some really, like, fluid motions. And I was like, oh, wow. Contrasting it to episode one with Yoda kind of doing these stunted movements, you can really feel it getting better even just over the course of season one. Hmm. Yeah, and by seven, um, season seven, it's, like, obviously a lot better. But then the hmm. weird thing is that Rebels came out between... A few of the seasons and animation in that is just like so bad. It's just <laughs> really bad. I don't understand because, like you said, I mean, I don't know anything about animation, but yeah, it seems like it starts off pretty 
pretty bad here and then you can see it get better. And then for some reason they brought out this whole series in between that just has this shocking animation. I don't really understand. Might have been a different team or something. Um, yeah. But like, I guess to, like on a similar note, I really, I, I've always enjoyed the aesthetic of the prequels. Um, like that was always the one thing I really latched onto in those first three is like, I just thought aesthetically they were really good and by far my favorite Star Wars movies. I, I think I realized a bit more seeing it in CGI like this. It's because it's very similar to Ratchet and Clank. There's a lot of Ratchet <laughs> and Clank style aesthetic to these, to these series. Um, and it's also organic. Like w- one of the cool things is all the machines are so organic looking. Like whenever they have tanks on, mm the thing they're like they they're built like giant beetles and stuff like it's even yeah. the separatists who are like the more machine based and and meant to be like evil and industrial side have fairly curvy sorts of like everything's curves on all their designs um yeah that's I really just, true I, i've just really like I've, I've always really liked it um in the movies and like watching it here i just i love how kind of yeah, organic is is just the word I'd use to describe so much of the aesthetic, and I, I've always really liked it. Space organic is the best. Mm. Speaking of who who wrote, somebody wrote on the Google Doc uh, a little afterthought that you know Jar Jar Binks was just the worst, so annoying, but they really liked his outfit. <laughs> I think that was <laughs> me. <laughs> was that? Yeah, that was me. I really like Jar Jar. He's got this like tie, this like cool yeah. purpley tie that he wears all the time, and I was like, I oh, no, that's such a like, cool tie." Weeks. I was like, "He's so annoying." I never once looked at his outfit. Went back and was like, "He is wearing a nice outfit." Actually. It's a cool outfit. He's got this like he wears like a vest and a tie, and he's just like he's got a radical style. I loved it. Oh yeah, no, I've got it up now. Yeah, with the the matching sleeves and tie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Wait, no, that's the matching sleeves. I don't think I noticed. It was more the cool purple tie. It's not even a tie. It's like a, I don't know what it is, but it just kind of flows around while he's like doing his Jar Jar Binks thing. And I guess maybe that's just how I got through scenes with him was just focus on how cool his outfit was and tune the rest of it out. And try to figure out like how he's a secretly a Sith Lord. That's how yeah. I get well, through them. I just try to he, no, the Sith he, he is. Like it's just all yeah. at, at the very least. He's an untrained, extremely powerful force user. It's <laughs> it's insane that he is brought on missions. Like they <laughs> they will bring yeah, him on missions, terrible. especially to say, Jar Jar, stay in the car, don't do anything. Like why did <laughs> they bring him? Yeah. Why? I don't understand. <laughs> they should honestly just lock him in a cupboard. Like he's so destructive, it doesn't make any sense that they bring him anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's good at, like, negotiating with aquatic creatures, maybe, and that's, like, it? I don't know. I can't believe he's good at negotiating with anyone. Um, Like, I think... Yeah. The, yeah, like, and that's where all the, like, Sith stuff comes in, because like, I think the thing for me is a lot of his, like, you know, it's meant to be that, like, klutzy physical humor stuff, but, it, like, yeah. it's, like, you know, so he'll trip over and sort of land on a gun, which fires a laser, which ricochets three times and kills the baddie. And it's just like, yeah. okay, you know, this has just happened four times in a row. It, it actually makes more sense to me if he's a Sith Lord than, like, if this is just meant to be, haha, like, stupid jokes. Um, yeah. And, and <laughs> like, you know, like, I, I know that doesn't make sense, but I just, the more I watched of this. No, it, no, it does. It had Jar Jar. I, I totally agree. <laughs> Oh, it doesn't yeah. make sense for him to be that lucky that often. <laughs> he has to be using the force. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, like I think it's just a thing you're not meant to read into because he's just a dumb joke for kids. But like, if you want to <laughs> treat this show and the three movies as like a complete piece that actually you want to add up and make sense, he has to be some kind of force user. Well, wasn't he also instrumental in helping Order sixty six like slip into place? Like, yes. This was yes. just my Googling. Did you come in your reading, probably? Yeah, so he's the one yeah. who um, uh, suggests giving Emperor Palpatine or then, uh, you know, Chairman or whatever, Chancellor Palpatine. Um, Chancellor, yeah. Basically the power to just stay in office forever and ever. Um, yeah. Again, another point in the Darth Jar Jar <laughs> column. Yeah. It, like, I, I, like, Darth Jar Jar is one of those things that it just, like, it starts off and you're like, haha, funny joke. And it's just the more I've sat with it, the more I'm like, for many reasons, this is better. Especially with episode nine, fresh in my memory, I just can't help but think mm. that if we were bringing back a character to be the villain for episode nine of the movies, 
even past the whole haha joke thing of it being Darth Jar Jar, I think that would have been more satisfying to me than <laughs> like what they ended up doing. Than <laughs> bringing back Palpatine. Yeah, definitely. Speaking of cool characters, it was kind of a really weird episode to end the season on with that one where the senators were trapped. Yeah. Um, it, it was mm. such an odd ending. But how cool is Cad Bane? Like the now, dude which one was he? Hat. He kind of looks oh, like okay. that Johnny yeah. Depp character from that movie, but he's got like, <laughs> he looks like the Rango, cool voice, yes. the blue skin and the red eyes and the big hat. He's cool. Yeah. I like Cad Bane. Yeah, I really liked their whole group of banditos. I, the, the funniest part to me was basically they were so talented because they could just shoot things without missing. <laughs> Which something yeah. everyone else in the Star Wars universe can't do. So they have this superpower of actually being able to hit what they shoot and suddenly they can like take on the entire Senate. That's great. Actually. It was great. I really liked it. A lot of the character design in this is, is fun. Like it's that aesthetic. Yeah. Um it is it's very good. I, I just really like the the vibe of the prequels. Yeah, and somebody pointed out on um Reddit one time that when you compare the alien designs in Star Wars um, when it was sort of under George Lucas versus when it's gone to Disney. Mm. Like, Disney has just made up, like, no cool aliens. Yeah. Yeah, they've got BB-8, yeah. and that's a droid. Yeah, but it's a circle instead of a cylinder like all the other yeah. droids. <laughs> that's all they've done. <laughs> they made yeah. the uh, Porgs. Does that count? Oh, uh, yeah, the merchandise things. <laughs> the, yeah, the little puffin things. Um, oh, from episode eight with the milk. Well, Luke drinks the milk, and they're around then. Yeah, the little penguin-like things. Is that what, am I thinking? Yeah, thing? yeah, those bird things. Yeah, okay. but yes, the like things like huts and um, the uh, Twi'leks, uh, which are this race that I uh, feature in the past, the final four episodes of the first season. They just have this cool kind of like floppy horns. I guess I don't know what you would call it. Yeah, and they're the ones from the prison episode of the Mandalorian as well. It's the two Twi'leks. Yeah, right. Yeah, uh, like there were so many really interesting alien designs. A lot of like insectoid style aliens as well that were very yep. cool. I um, mean, even yeah. the robot designs I I thought were pretty cool. Like Grievous was. This is one episode where they go to Grievous's like house. <laughs> I guess. Oh, yeah, I yeah. love and that episode. It's so he's weird. Like, yeah, and he's just like monkey. Like they chop off the his like his bottom legs and he's just kind of monkey barring around for like five or ten minutes of this episode and it's the craziest thing I yeah. absolutely and he's always like it. scuttling around like a like a spider and Grievous yes. is awesome he's just such a interesting character yeah. when Gra- whenever Grievous switches from like loping you know humanoid mode to fucking crazy spider mode it's just when you know shit's gotten real like he's he's a very yeah. fun design yeah and he'll be fighting with lightsabers and then, you know, he'll there was this one bit where he was fighting and then, you know, he's got his lightsabers and he's like locked in combat and then just another arm comes out of nowhere and shoots somebody. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. like, fuck Grievous, you're so cool. It's funny because he's he's actually such a boring character, but he's like yeah. physically very interesting, yes. which I don't think I've yeah. seen before. Like you just want to watch him fight all the time. Yeah. I give I don't care at all about his personality. Oh, and yeah. I like his voice. Like the oh, his yeah. voice is great. Do you know actually the guy who does that voice voices all of the droids as well, and that's in oh. the films and and the TV show. I think it's like the that's one right. guy. Because <laughs> I was going to say, like, like obviously it was different uh, actors because because the the animated movie I think had pretty much all the same actors as the the films. Like Samuel L. Jackson played Mace Window. Oh, in the, really? In the there movie. You go. But he didn't in the TV show, and that was noticeable. Yeah. It actually took me a while to notice that it was not um, what's his name playing Obi Wan in this show. Um, wait, the the guy playing Obi Wan in this show is a very good impersonator of um. Yeah, he's what, pretty good. What's the name of the guy who plays Obi Wan in the? Ewan McGregor. I can't his name. Yeah. How could you him. forget Ewan McGregor's yes, name? Yes, I know. Oh. I I know he's <laughs> I know he's your obsession, but um. <laughs> I've been obsessed with him since that Alex Ryder movie. Yeah, I remember. This is like a pretty uh, oh my god! <laughs> but wow. uh, yeah, they, so they they have James Arnold Taylor uh, play him in the show. That's actually the the voice actor of Ratchet and Clank. So that's another connection to Ratchet and Clank. There you go. Fact. Huh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like he does a very good Ewan McGregor impression. Like I, I does. I barely yeah. noticed it wasn't him. I thought all the voice acting was really good. Like I think it was probably of all the technical elements, the one that I found the best. There was just so much good. 
like emotive voice act. Even mm. I, I don't know what these like I don't fucking know what Hayden Christensen's Anakin sounds like because I've never watched the prequels. But I loved it. I loved his voice acting. I loved Ahsoka. I loved all of them. I especially loved. Um, there's one where Phil Lamar, who's a voice actor who played uh, Hermes in Futurama, is like this Jedi who's I don't know what he is. He's also oh, got Kit floppy Fisto. horns. Kit Fisto. That's it. Yeah, oh, I yeah, loved yeah, it. He yeah. was so good. <laughs> Yeah, actually, another little fun fact, uh, you know, the prison episode of The Mandalorian where there's that guy who they end up um, shooting or killing, um, that's actually the guy who plays Anakin in all the animated stuff, like he voices oh, him. Okay. It's like such a random little cameo that they gave him in The Mandalorian. Watching this, after watching The Mandalorian, and you already said touch on this, I recognised a bunch of designs from The Mandalorian and even some mm. of the new movies in this show like i hadn't realized that those were already established in the universe mm. like it made me it made me think even more of the mandalorian like i i don't know if i've talked about this on air but the mandalorian made me appreciate all like the original star wars trilogy or it it, it captured my imagination as a world like people talk about the original trilogy doing for them like i mm. really loved the mandalorian and the vibe it created and i didn't realize how much of it was just sort of stuff that already existed yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is a it is a rich universe, one that has so much more potential than the movies that I've seen give it. <laughs> yeah, and I think the movies really don't touch on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the movies um, are are just there to tell the Skywalker saga or whatever, and, and that's the most boring stuff. Honestly, I don't know. Like, yeah. it's fine. It's just I don't think it stands yeah. up. It's it's good too, but. Even Clone Wars were saying this would be even better if it was just focusing on the actual clones. Like, there's yeah. there's such a rich universe and it's almost kind of wasted just focusing on these, um, you know, Force users. Well, the thing I liked most about the show, apart from all this clone stuff, was they would go to a different planet and just have an interaction with an interesting race of creatures. Like, the one we mentioned before where they go to, I think it's called Trespass. They go to this, like, moon and there's this kind of race of Yeti-like creatures there. Yeah, God, and they're it, cool. Yeah, yeah, and it's a great episode because they just interact with this really interesting race of creatures and they have a really interesting plot of trying to stop uh, the Senate fucking over a, a native race yeah. of people, basically. <laughs> um, Elliot, have you been converted to a Star Wars fan now? I've got to admit, I'm keen to actually rewatch the prequels, which is something that hasn't happened <laughs> since I was, like, 16. So, like, been not, yes. Not, not yes, but not no. Um, Damn, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I, yeah, I definitely say like I always felt like it was a series of movies that weren't that great, but there was a lot of potential in the universe, and this is sort of, you know, it, it feels like you're that. actually using it. Yeah, yeah. it fills up that gap. Mm. Oh, good show. I loved it. It was great. Yeah. I'm gonna keep watching oh, it for glad sure. Glad you guys liked it. You know what I, you know what I, I think I really liked about it. It did remind me of like Stargate or all those very episodic yes. sci-fi. Yeah, shows like there's something to just there. There are a couple of episodes, like you said, that that one you guys keep bringing up, where they they went to like the Yeti planet and and they had the thing. I'm pretty yeah. sure there's like six Stargate episodes that do the exact same thing, where they end up on some planet, they meet a, an advanced culture, and then they find there's a primitive culture, and they have to stop the primitive culture getting oppressed. Like, yeah, they, they're all these sorts of common story tropes to a lot of these sci-fi shows that I obviously just you know. It's my bread and butter, so uh, I think that really helped me just get into this show. Yeah, it's mm. got that just kind of mix of they make you think about morality just enough to keep it interesting, but at the same time it's all... Not enough to just, challenge just, me. Yeah, not enough to challenge <laughs> you too much, and so that it's still just so easy to watch. Like, you can just sit there and watch it all day mm. and not get tired, emotionally exhausted. There was one episode where that didn't work, or was it... Yeah, it was just one episode. And it's they go to this planet with these, like, monkey things, and George oh, Takei yeah. shows up as a villain. And um, these monkey creatures are, like, completely non-violent, like they're complete pacifists, to the extent that one of them at one point says, if it's our destiny to be destroyed in your war, so be it. And they're just going to, yeah. like, lie down and die. And I was like, I can't handle this. Like, I, See, I'm not thing- on board with their morality right now. No, I think that's the thing. One thing I really liked about that is that you do, you find them so annoying and yep. you think, oh, I never thought I'd be on the side. He was like, yeah, fight, kill. But these things just make you want to scream. Like they're so annoying. And the yes. whole thing is basically about the Jedi being 
that saying that you need to sometimes fight for what you believe and you can't just roll over and die. And then the very <laughs> next episode is the trespass episode where yeah. it's like the opposite and the Jedi are sitting yeah. there saying oh. you can't just walk around killing people all day. You yeah, can't you can't just, just you fight for whatever you believe this. in, gosh, yeah. Yeah, and it's sort of funny because it's sort of like really, it's like whiplash between those two yeah. episodes. And yeah. I don't know whether it's like sort of just stupid or whether it was like a stroke of genius making you think about how, you know, there's a time and a place or, you know, what, what like it all changes depending on what situation you're in, whether it's the right thing to strive for peace or to fight for what you think is right or yeah. whatever. But I found yeah. that really funny just having those two <laughs> episodes funny. back to back. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I Anytime the Jedi's morality came up, it just drove me a bit mental, I think, just because they're <laughs> so inconsistent in their terrible bureaucracy. Yeah, which I think is supposed to be intentional. At least yeah. that's how I perceive it because otherwise, it, yeah, it's just really stupid. It's too sad. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Like Jedi, whenever Jedi doctrine comes up where, you know, it's like a good Jedi, no, 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 no. It's almost always yeah. I'm like, that. I, I, I'm sure I can find an example where you've said essentially the opposite. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. 100%. Um, oh, man. All right. We've been talking about the show for a solid amount of time. Should we? Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts you want to talk about, Elliot? No, I think. Yeah, Darth Jar Jar, I, it's a thing. <laughs> the highest credit I can give the show is it genuinely made me care about the lore of the Star Wars universe, so I think that's a, a pretty big win. Um, yeah, I would have to say the same. Should we rate it out of 10? What are you going to give it, Elliot? I'll let you go first, because otherwise you'll, you'll just copy me. Yeah, uh, I'm going <laughs> to give it an 8.5. Oh, wow. Oh, that's I, pretty high. I think you... I, I know that the more I watch the show, the more I'm going to enjoy it, but I found so much of the Jedi stuff too frustrating in Season 1 that I'm going to give it a seven, but I know I'm going to enjoy it more after I watch more. So a seven yeah. for season one, and we'll oh, see how we go fair. the seasons progress. Yeah, I, I would definitely say, like, you know, I'm I'm like four episodes into season three or, or something, and it's like I enjoyed season two a lot more than season one. Yeah. So, like, it, if we were doing this and I'd, I was only one season in, it'd probably be more like a seven and a half, but um, yeah. season two was a, a, a decent step up. Yeah, cool. All right. Pretty good. Um, so what are we talking about next fortnight, Elliot? Yeah. Um, okay. It's my turn. Don't answer you, you that. You did this my bit. Turn to you did this bit last time. This is the same joke that uh, we did last time it was your turn. I th- oh, yeah. We're running out of original content. Um, <laughs> but here's a new thing that I can't believe you haven't seen yet, Elliot. The film called Silence of the Lambs. This is like a serial killer one, isn't it? Like, is this the one with yeah. the... the- the put the baby put the lotion on or whatever yeah oh my god maybe you have seen it no um, <laughs> no this is a classic film elliot and it's crazy to me that you haven't seen it uh the this is a film about and well it's not really i mean it's not but uh it's film directed by jonathan demi um it is a about a fbi agent who's trying to track down a serial killer um and featured in this is so uh, hold is on. Hannibal Lecter. Didn't didn't mm. we just do a TV show on this? Um with Jonathan Groff? Is are, are we doing that again? Oh. <laughs> uh this is not <laughs> This is fictional. This is not a real oh, uh, okay. story. It's based on a yeah. book. Um but it has spawned the Hannibal Lecter character, who is a character that appears in uh, the okay. story, like yeah. the TV show Hannibal, um yeah. played by Anthony Hopkins. And this is a great movie, Elliot, and it's crazy to me that you haven't seen it. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, and I kind of just wanted to prescribe it because you should have seen it. It is just <laughs> an incredibly good movie. It's incredibly well made. It's one of the best, like, most tense movies. It's like a thriller, kind of obviously, like a crime thriller um, about trying to track down this serial killer. And um, it's incredible. Like, the tension, there's masterful, man- like, manipulation of tension in this movie, even though. The well, we'll talk about that stuff later. Talk spoiler <laughs> stuff in Fortnite, but the, like the tension in this movie is so so good, it's like a masterstroke. Um, there's this one scene in an elevator. Well, actually, there's multiple tense scenes in an elevator, but what I'm talking about is a moment where just our main character goes into an elevator with a bunch of men, and it's like you'll see this scene when you get up to it, it's genuinely the most well shot incredible scene because i should say a lead character played by jodie foster 
plays Clarice Starling, who's a woman in the FBI in the eighties, I think. I'm not hundred percent sure, but a lot of this movie kind of revolves around the fact that she exists in really a boys' club to a large extent. And this was, I think, the first movie that really, I think, excelled at showing a female perspective on this kind of horrifying, very masculine FBI world of tracking down serial killers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. It, yeah, interesting. It's one of the reasons I like it so much. Apart from the fact that it's just a really well-made, scary and, or well, not scary, but like tense movie. The three main characters, uh, well, Jodie Foster and Anthony Hopkins are the two main characters and uh, Ted Levine plays another very important character in this movie. And they're all so, so good. Um, Anthony Hopkins, who plays Hannibal, won uh, the Oscar or was nominated or won the Oscar. I can't remember. Uh, for Best Supporting Actor. He has got a total of, I think, 15 or 18 minutes of screen time in this movie. And he is so charismatic. In fact, I shouldn't have said that because I would, if I had asked you in a fortnight, how much screen time do you think Hannibal actually gets? Like, n- you wouldn't be able to answer that question correctly just because he's, he's such a, like, tour de force. And Jodie Foster and Ted Levine both live up to him in this sense. E- everyone in the film does. They're all so, so good. Um, I just can't believe you haven't seen it, I guess. <laughs> and so I'm excited for you to finally see it. Genuinely, I think one of the best movies that has ever been. I mean, that's really interesting, because I actually assumed it was about Hannibal Lecter. Um, so now I'm kind of going into it. I This prescription has made me less sure of what I'm looking into than yeah. I thought. Everyone thinks it's about Hannibal Lecter. It's not. I had a bit of a picture of what I was going into. that You've thrown yeah. that away, which is like kind of fun, because, um, yeah. you know, with things like, like, you know, Silence of the Lambs or like Back to the Future or The Sixth Sense, like Mm. even without having seen those movies, I feel like I know a bunch about them just through like, you know, the the way they're permeated pop culture. Um, Yeah. But apparently I was wrong about this one. Yeah, you you are. And this is the thing. Everyone kind of thinks they know what this movie is about if they haven't seen it because Hannibal has become such an iconic character. But this film is so much more nuanced than I think, like, it, it it really just is a really good movie. And it, it even the fact that people think they know what it's about does it a disservice because it's so much better than the idea that people have of it. And I will never stop standing this movie until the day I die just because it is genuinely so incredibly well made and so nuanced and deep and, like, brilliant. It's It just is a brilliant movie. Yeah, okay. Well, um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm keen to check it out. Yeah, you you'll enjoy it. I guarantee you. Uh, when we've broken the spoilers barrier next fortnight, we can uh, talk about it in more detail. I don't yes. want to get too too into it right now because um, it's a lot of like it's a a story with interesting twists and turns and stuff. So talk about okay. it when we get to it. But just you'll love it, Elliot. It's if, and if you don't, I don't know what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I'm gonna be upset because <laughs> it's just like it's just so good. Okay. And that's all there is to say about it, Elliot. That's the end of our show. Go and watch it. And I'm so disappointed you haven't already seen it. And I don't know how we've done three years of the show and I haven't yeah. made you watch this movie yet. I, I, at this point, that's just as much on you as it is on me, really. Yeah, it's true. We've been doing Medium D for three years now. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, but I'm re- rectifying that mistake. Uh, and we'll be back in a fortnight to talk about it. Uh, but that's the end of our episode. Um, thanks to Georgia again for coming on and talking about Clone Wars, uh, which is a great show that I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, if you want to uh, leave us your thoughts on Clone Wars or on Sons of the Lambs, the best way to do that is by contacting us, uh, shooting us an email at mediamdpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, yes, you can also find us on, uh, you know, iTunes. I mean, you know, that's yep. where you yep. probably might be listening to this. Or Stitcher, Google Play. Or any podcast thing. Yeah. YouTube, and- you can watch us on YouTube, apparently. Yeah. say. Um, and you know, when you do that, there's usually the option to leave ratings or in YouTube's case, or like, and subscribe, um, yep. thumbs up. And when you do that, um, we get points in the algorithm and that helps, you know, raise our mm-hmm. profile, Doof's profile. Uh, yeah. And we can redeem those points for all kinds of prizes, stuff, toys, sticky hands, candies, lollipops. So it is worth it to us if you give us a good review. Yes. Um, if you want to do something a bit more tangible, um, like you, mm-hmm. you want to be directly involved in improving MediaMD, uh, head on over to patreon.com forward slash doofmedia, uh, because all the doof shows pretty much 
only exist in the way they do because of uh, our patrons. Yeah, Doof Media is a patron-supported network, and so all the shows that we do are because patrons want us to do them and, and support us financially to do them. Um, we have new shows on the network because people, you know, help support it. Uh, new shows like Decomposing Worm, which is a new show that has just started on the network and has already become the uh, the beloved darling, I think. <laughs> Yes, Everyone's I already really, really enjoyed it. I just finished the first episode as of uh, the day we're recording this, and it was very fun. Mm. I can't wait for yeah. part two, which will be coming out the day after this episode, where Clarence and Matthias are going to start doing um, the you know the the special source of their show, which is like actual literary analysis stuff on yes. uh, Worm. Yeah, it, it's exciting. It's exciting to have a show that is. Um... It comes from a more literary professional point of view, I yeah. suppose. <laughs> yeah, they're doing all this real stuff. Like they're talking about different modes of analysis, which is, is oh. well beyond me, and I can't wait to learn about yeah. through them talking about worm. On this show, we just talk about whether we like Jedi's or not, <laughs> and if <laughs> yes. it's even called Jedi's or just Jedi. This is going to be even, like a lot more serious and professional in terms of analysis, yeah. which should be really fun. Yeah. Um, if you want to check out links to the stuff that we've just talked about. You can head to the website, which is doofmedia.com. That has links to leave us a review, contact us, check out the other shows, as well as all the previous clues for the Media MD ARG, where you can help us figure out just who is Dr. MD and why is his Togruta so similar to Twilex? Elliot, why don't you tell the listeners this fortnight's clue? Eye drops. Eye drops. And we'll see you next week.